morning, everybody. Okay, so y'all can hear me, right? Yes, you can. Someone said good morning. <laughs> okay, so today um, we're going to finish up the slides about minerals, specifically going back to um, what we were talking about, the, min the silicate subclasses, the different crystallographic orientation like the the way that the it describes how the silica tetrahedra are arranged in the different mineral groups and those groups like for example the the micas that i kept talking about like the biotite and the muscovite that i kept talking about these two samples it's number seven and number 12. Um, these two guys are phyllosilicates, like phyllo dough. I mentioned that before. Thin sheets, so sh you can think of them as sheet silicates. That's another way to describe them. You don't have to remember the Latin, the phyllosilicate. Maybe that's Greek. Doesn't matter. Um, just remember sheet silicate and ring silicate and chain silicate. That that sort of thing. For you know, I want you to understand. What I want you to get out of this is that biotite and, mus biotite and muscovite are both micas. They're both in the same mineral group. And what that means is that their physical and their optical properties, you're not going to look at their optical properties down a microscope. Um, you're going to look at their physical properties. So you're going to be able to test the hardness, for example. Um, the, the, all the micas share those properties. And um, in fact, when you do actually perform your minerals lab, that'll be combined with the igneous rocks. Uh, I, what, I'll, what I like to do is to study rocks by studying the minerals that are included in them. So I'm going to focus on next week the minerals that are found in igneous rocks. And that's a lot of the ones that you've got here. Uh, anyway, and so I want you to be able to distinguish some of those mineral groups using their physical properties. That's what the hardness testing is all about. That's what the streak testing is about. And we're going to go through um, more of that. And I'm going to show you the website that we're going to use. So in addition to your uh, the hand specimens that you have in your kits, I'm going to have you virtually test minerals and then try to identify minerals using a website that I found that I think is pretty spectacular. It's like really, when I first saw it, I was like, wow, this is the next best thing to being able to test the minerals in person. So I'll go over that today and show you what the website is all about. And we can run through all the different um, ways that you can virtually test your minerals. That I think will help you to actually do the the actual physical tests on your minerals because you'll see the examples online and then you can actually do the same tests um, in live and in person on your minerals kit. Okay. Let me pull up lecture slides. Any questions about anything? I know the exam is going on right now. I just finished grading lab 5A. Oh, let me explain that. So I broke lab 5A and 5B into, it's one lab. It's, it's, I do this, it's one, it's one lab. 
5A is worth 20%, so 20 points, and 5B is going to be 80 points or 80% 80 of that lab. All your labs are 100 points. I just make them all the same. So, uh, yeah, anyway, 20, 80 for those two. So that's why if you see a score of 19 or 20 on your fi lab 5A, don't freak out. That's most of the points or all of the points. Okay, and I hope to get to lab six today. I'm going to do lab six first grading um, before I do lab 5B because 5B is going to take a lot longer. Okay, here we are. Let me share my screen. I'm working on getting a second monitor set up. I tried, I got the, oh, that's the wrong screen, sorry. I got the, um, that's so that I can see all my windows all at once and even see the chat. But um, I'm having a hard time hooking it up. Like I tried doing it um, wirelessly and then I tried doing it wired and the monitor didn't like the USB cable. So I have to, one more try before I have to get a new monitor, I think, to work with my new computer. Okay, here we were. We, we left off, okay. Can you guys help me remember exactly where we left off? I, oh boy. Seven silicate mineral subclasses. Thank you. This one? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Really, we only got 10 slides in. You didn't, I didn't start, no, I didn't show you those. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, thank you, Kay. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I, I added, this looks a little different than what you saw on Tuesday because I added some pictures of like uh, an example mineral from that group or like a, the example that you'll see in your kits. Uh, so there are basically seven groups of silicate minerals. Remember there's still non-silicate minerals and I'll talk about those a little bit. Those are like um, minerals that ha are called oxide minerals or sulfate minerals uh, like gypsum. You've got a couple of gypsum samples in your kits. Um, or phosphates or, yeah, I, I will, ex actually, let me just go there. Okay, so I threw in uh, an extra periodic table of the elements. I bet you haven't looked at one of these, a periodic table, since chemistry class in high school, and um, hopefully you will again in chemistry at San Francisco State, if that's part of your studies. What I wanted to show you the periodic table for is I keep talking about the, the cations, the positively charged ions. Those are these on the left-hand side of the periodic table. So in groups one, two, three, these are positively charged. So um, they bond to the negatively charged ions that come out, out from the right-hand side of your periodic table. And oftentimes what this means is like, look where silicon is, number 14, and oxygen, number eight. So silicates are the silicon and oxygen bonded together. The other mineral groups that I just mentioned, phosphates, phosphorus and oxygen, sulfates, sulfur and oxygen, um, carbonates, carbon and oxygen. Uh, there are fluorides, fluorine and oxygen, or borates, bor you get the idea. They all bond to oxygen. Oxygen is the most common element. The cat is back. That's Ted. Okay. Um, these, so all the mineral groups, they bond with oxygen. It's the most common element on earth in the crust. Um, these are, they form negative charged ions but they're covalently bonded. 
meaning they have a really strong bond. So the bond between the silicon and the oxygen is really strong. It's hard to break. Carbonates, the carbon and oxygen is hard to break. It's less hard to break though. Um, phosphorus and oxygen, nitrogen and oxygen, sulfur and oxygen, all of those are forming covalent bonds, strong bonds. Um, so the idea is these form a molecule or an ion. An ion is simply a, a molecule that has a charge. So it's either negative or positive. It's not neutrally balanced so that it's just hanging out there like salt is neutrally balanced, like sodium and chloride. That doesn't have a charge until you dissolve it. And then the sodium and the chloride have charges. The sodium is positive, it's over here on the left, and the chloride, chlorine is negative, it's over here on the right. Um, so the silicate ions, those bond with sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, those are the, the main ones, we're missing one. Titanium is part of that too manganese also iron is in there too so some these are the transition metals so the these guys in pink um behave in a similar way to these as, as like positively charged cations so the idea is i mean you don't have to remember all this i just want to explain it to you so the all of the minerals are formed by combining some of these positively charged ions at, with these molecules that are that form the anion, the negatively charged ion. Okay. Now that this is in the slides, you'll be able to come back to that and just um, rem remember what it is I said. You, you know, as far as the minerals are concerned, I'm just gonna, you know, I pointed out some things about that require knowledge of the elements. I pointed out that mafic rocks have more iron and magnesium and less silica than felsic rocks. So felsic rocks have more sodium, more potassium, more aluminum than um, the mafic rocks do and more silica. That sort of translates to the minerals because the minerals are what make up the rocks, right? So mafic rocks have more of these dark minerals and that includes all of these over here. Um, the olivine that is one of, that is made up of isolated tetrahedra. So it's literally iron and magnesium bonded to a silicon tetrahedra. It's a really simple um, and co compared to some of the, like the, the quartz and feldspar, which are a 3D network of silica tetrahedra. The pyroxenes and the amphibole, so this is a group, and I, I kind of like, I go back and forth, and I'm sorry about that. Augite is one of the pyroxene group minerals. There are lots of different pyroxenes that have different names than augite. Augite is one of these that is like, it's a generic name for a, a, one of these pyroxenes because it's got calcium and magnesium and iron. It's, it's got like a, it's kind of a mishmash of all those cations like put together to form this sort of greenish black um, elongate mineral that uh, is a single chain of the silica tetrahedra. There are double chain structures that, um, like the horn blends, which are in the amphibole group. I, I think you're, well, you're gonna run into other pyroxenes and other amphiboles when you do your, the online, the virtual testing of minerals, you certainly will. In your kits, you only have like one example of some of these. And I don't think you have, you don't have a pyroxene or a horn blend or a, an amphibole in there. <clears throat> so those will be virtual. Same with the olivine. I'm just looking down at the rock and mineral kits to make sure. Yeah, you don't have any olivine in your rocks either, but you probably have pyroxene and hornblend. We'll get to those. Okay, so you've got examples of these in your rocks, not the olivine. <clears throat> okay, so we've done 
isolated st tetrahedra chain structures, a single and a double chain, that affects their physical properties actually, because the agite, all of the pyroxenes in fact, have um, what's called a, a, did we go over the properties yet? I've forgotten. No, we haven't. Um, it's got, what we will do today. It's got a cleavage, a natural place where the mineral breaks if you were to hit it with a hammer. You know, I don't recommend doing that to your specimens because you're going to lose them pretty quickly. Um, but you can see the cleavage by looking closely at those specimens. So for instance, the, all of the pyroxenes have um, two cleavage planes, so nice shiny surfaces. You can even see them in this image a little bit. The, those shiny flat surfaces, just like the shiny flat surface on, your mi on the micas, so that shiny surface is a cleavage plane. Remember we talked about how the sheet silicates, they break along those sheets. Um, that's one cleavage and the micas only have one, but the pyroxenes and the amphiboles have two. The pyroxenes, the cleavage planes intersect at 90 degrees and the, the amphiboles all have a, it's either a 60 degree or a 120 degree uh, angle between those planes. And so you can tell them apart that way, even though both of them look like dark, like little long logs, log shaped minerals. Okay, the micas, the muscovite and the biotite, I just put biotite there because the muscovite doesn't show up so well because it's just like light colored. Um, the sheet silicates, you're getting familiar with them. Um, the framework silicate structures. Framework, you can think of a 3D network or 3D framework. Think of it as like building blocks or something like that. It's not just in this dimension, it's also in this dimension, a horizontal and a vertical dimension as you're like building that mineral. Um, quartz, which is just silic silicon and oxygen at, in, in a certain ratio. Uh, that's a framework silicate and all the feldspars. So you have an example of feldspar, the light pink one and your quartz, your quartz doesn't look like that. It doesn't look, it's not a point. It is a white, probably most of yours are the same. I'm not saying all of them are the same, but the quartz is a white, uh, opaque, although some parts of it are a little bit translucent. Like you can see light come through the edges I recommend that you just pull these out when I pull them out too. The feldspar, you should be able to see, there's no cleavage in quartz, but you should be able to, you should be able to see the cleavage at least on one plane for the feldspar. Just rotate the specimen until you see light flash off of one of the flat surfaces. So, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to do this for the camera so much, but um, compare a rough edge like this to a flat shiny edge like that. Hopefully I can get some light glinting off of that for you. Let me know if you're not seeing it and I can hold it up differently. Um, this one looks like it's got two that I can pick out. So here's one cleavage plane there and there's another one here. And so they intersect. I'm trying to look for something I can use except for my fingers. No, that's not good. Okay, they intersect at a 90 degree angle like that. So that's another defining characteristic of, some, of the feldspars. Okay, uh, there are a couple more examples. So we've gone through five already of those silicate subclasses. There are ring silicates. These they have other names, don't worry about these other names, the cyclosilicate, just write ring silicate instead. Um, tourmaline is probably, and I put some watermelon tourmaline there, the green and pink tourmalines. Uh, don't know where this one came out of, although they, they come from San Diego too, locally. Uh, that's a great example. These two mineral groups are kind of smaller mineral groups. There are fewer minerals that fall into the paired silicate 
structures and the ring silicates. So the pair, an example of a paired silicate would be epidote, which is a green, it's kind of a little bit hard to see, but it's a green mineral that is fairly common actually. Both tourmaline and, and epidote are pretty common, despite the fact that there are fewer minerals in those groups. So there's one example at least from each of the silicate subgroups. And this is what I'm talking about when I mention their structures. And when I talk about the mineral groups, I'm talking about pyroxenes, amphiboles. The specific example is the mineral hornblende, the mineral augite. The minerals are given different names based on their chemistry. The structure is overall very similar or exactly the same and different ions, different cations pop in in, in, in place of other ions. Recall I, I mentioned um, sodium and, and calcium substituting in a solid solution in the, the structure of a feldspar. Okay, where are we? Okay, so we've already talked about this. I'll skip forward. Let me give you some more examples of the isolated tetrahedra. Um, I brought, I borrowed these from my mineralogy class, so I still uh, include this term here, the nesosilicate. I don't want you to worry about that. I want you to remember or think about it being an an isolated or a single tetrahedra. I'm just gonna leave that as single. I'm not gonna add the word isolated. I think you get the idea. It's probably easy to remember like single tetrahedra. Okay, olivine. There's an example of peridot. That's a gem quality olivine. Topaz is one example. Um, topaz can show up as blue. You may have run across it as a gem that's blue. I believe that topaz acquires that blue color when it's treated with heat. Um, it might not be natural, or it certainly is, an, if it is a natural color, the color is enhanced by being treated with heat in a laboratory after they collect it. That's pretty true with a lot of minerals, actually, to try to enhance the color. Okay, so, um, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll run through these. Garnet, you may have run across. It's this red rounded uh, crystal. This, these are the dodecahedrons uh, when they're nice and perfectly formed. Oftentimes though, you just see them as these rounded crystals. Uh, kyanite, I mentioned on my necklace. I don't always wear this one, but kyanite is this blue mineral that's really, there aren't a lot of blue minerals. So it's a nice blue one. It's pretty. Uh, and the starlight, these are tw mineral twins. So they're actually, it's kind of like an error that is made when the crystal is growing. And in this case, it's like two crystals growing together and they share, they share some of the silica tetrahedra. They share some of the iron and aluminum in that mineral. Um, so the bonds are shared. So while they're two separate crystals, in between, they're, um, it's almost like they're one. This is not a twin. This is just a variety of andalusite that forms this nice um, cross-shaped structure. Um, it's, it ends up because there's graphite, you know, in graphite in your pencils, it's carbon that actually decorates the, the crystal edges there. And um, that's why it kind of looks like that. There's carbon in here where it's black. So it helps form this cross shape. Um, the um, silimonite is in here is like an, a, in a little elongate. I should have replaced that picture. There are better pictures of silimonite. And not only that, but you can't even see the word silimonite. Ta-da, there we go. Okay, those three are polymorphs. That means they, poly meaning many, morphs meaning form. Um, all three of these minerals, andalusite, silimonite, kyanite, have this formula, two aluminums and SiO5. Even though they're the same chemistry, they have different crystal structures, 
that form at different pressure and temperature conditions in the earth. So for example, kyanite grows in rocks that have been metamor undergoing metamorphism in the deeper part of the crust. So high pressures, that's, what, that's where the Al2SO IO5 acquires its kyanite structure at high pressures. And those are the kinds of rocks that I study and hence the kyanite also. Um, Silimonite grows at high temperatures. And so that's um, at sometimes lower pressures, but definitely higher temperatures than the kyanite. And the leucite is only forms at low pressures and relatively low temperatures. And so just, it's in, I hope that it's interesting for you guys to see that there's a lot of complexity to minerals. Okay. Um, Oh, the solid solution. Let me just mention this. So garnet is another nice example of solid solution. And the solid solution in garnet is, I can highlight in the, here in the parentheses, iron, magnesium, calcium, and manganese. <clears throat> the formula suggests that there are three of those, meaning all total, all of the iron, magnesium, calcium, and manganese in that mineral should add up to three when you um, are looking at the formula numbers for the, these chemistries. So the Al2Si3O12 part of the formula is giving you the overall structure of the mineral. And the cations are giving you its chemistry. Does that make kind of sense? So the, the silicate part of these minerals controls the structure, the and that's the negative part, the anion, the positively charged cations from the left-hand side of the periodic table, those are the chemistry, control the chemistry. Okay, so solid solution there, there's solid solution in olivine between iron and magnesium, da-da-da. Any questions about um, these isolated silicate tetrahedra, silica tetrahedra. Okay, paired tetrahedra. So I, um, I think I've put these in order from simplest structures, silicate structures to more, more complicated structures. So I'm going from single tetrahedra to a pair of tetrahedra to a ring, to chains, to a 3D framework. So sorosilicates, these paired tetrahedra, um, there are two silica tetrahedra. They share a single oxygen that leaves six other oxygens that connect with the other cations. Uh, Lawsonite is a nice example. It, it, I'm afraid that the picture is not so nice because <laughs> it's kind of like a whitish, tannish mineral. It's right here. I guess it's, this one's I call brown. Um, there is lostonite locally. And I mean, there's a lot of these minerals locally. Um, Ring Mountain, I keep mentioning Ring Mountain as being an example of where we've got uh, the melange, the, the Franciscan rocks, the, those ophiolitic rocks that were abducted onto the edge of the continent that contain the serpentinite, the pillow basalts, the charts, all the oceanic rocks that were scraped or that were abducted, as well as the very high pressure rocks that were subducted deeply and maybe into the mantle depths and then slices were brought back up or pieces were brought back up to the surface. Um, Lawsonite occurs with a rock called blue schist and it is kind of bluish. It's not like blue blue, like the kyanite's blue, but it has like a blue color to it. And um, there's some nice big climbing boulders where you can see lawsonite at Ring Mountain and Tiburon. Here's some more epidote. It, look, it can look like this in these nice long prisms. It can also be sort of a form this like a small rounded crystal. So it, they, the minerals don't always look like this. I'm giving you examples that are big enough to see and where you can see more detail about what the mineral looks like instead of it just like being a speck in a rock, basically. 
um, there's a lot more information down here than you need, really. I guess I mentioned the glock. I mentioned the blue schist. Glaucophane is an amphibole mineral, like hornblende. It's an amphibole group mineral, but it's blue, which is fun or lavender sort of colored. Epidote shows up a lot um, as what's called an accessory mineral. It means it, 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 it's a very small percentage of the whole rock. So 1% maybe, or 2% at most. Um, it, as it occurs in granitic rocks, like granites that you find in the Sierra Nevada. You might see a green speck here and there, and a pale green speck. Those are epidotes. Ring silicates. Okay. I actually have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I noticed that in the chemical formula for lawsonite, it's hydrated. Um, it how does hydrated. the water play with um playing with the structure? Good question. I don't know where it fits in the structure. Um, it is true that most of the time we're talking about water, actual water in the structure. Um, that applies to the mineraloids, not actual minerals, but like um, uh, chert, for example, is made, it's not made up of quartz, it's silica. It's like a, it's not a fully crystalline, um, it's not fully crystalline quartz. In this case, this is fully crystalline. Lawsonite is a mineral. Um, I will have to get back to you on like what it looks like structurally. I can't think of a resource that I have off the top of my head, so I'm going to have to dig a little bit for that. Okay. Okay. The, Thank you. Um, you're welcome. The OH, so the hydroxyl pairs, I've mentioned the hydroxyl pairs, OH. Um, this one, it's just a, a single OH and not even a pair. And sometimes it can be like four of them, whatever, many of them. Um, those are structural water. Those aren't actual water in the crystal lattice. Um, but when those minerals are, these are great examples of hydrous minerals. That's what I mean by hydrous. They contain structural water. Um, when these minerals are metamorphosed, if they were to go down the subduction zone, those would be some of the minerals that give water off that lower the melting temperature of the mantle and, and generate um, uh, partial melts of the mantle that give us volcanic arcs. So they contribute to the flux melting? Sure. Yep. Uh, I probably, I mean, they're not in, these minerals are not in large quantities, but yes, they would contribute. There are, let's see, the nesosilicates Start, a couple of them, topaz and starlight are hydrous, but most of them are not. You see no hydrous group there. Um, cyclosilicates. Some, again, some of these are hydrous, like the tourmaline is hydrous. There's OH4. The barrel is not. It doesn't have the OH pair. So tourmaline is another example that could contribute structural water to during metamorphism. So the tourmaline, basically what happens during metamorphism is like I try to describe it as um, kind of putting ingredients into a big stew pot or chili. You can think of it as chili or a stew or whatever it is, you, uh, um, whatever, however you want to envision it. The chemical components are like the ingredients. You put them into the stew pot and how it comes out is different. Like all those ingredients look different than when you put them into the stew pot. So tourmaline would contribute all of these, like the manganese, iron, aluminum, lithium, calcium, sodium, all of those would go into the stew pot. But tourmaline would then change and become something else. It, it would like these might contribute to the growth of garnet instead. And then you would have a breakdown of the water and of the, the mineral as a whole. It would change its structure during metamorphism. Oh, wait, did I go over this one? No, I didn't go over this one yet. So the ring, the ring structures, 
uh, let's see, several gemstones, so like beryl. Aquamarine is the blue variety of beryl. Um, beryl is also another gemstone, emerald. So <laughs> depending on the color, this mineral is two different gems. So if it's green, it's an emerald. If it's blue, it's aquamarine. These often occur in what are called pegmatites. It's like you've heard of dikes, cross-cutting struck like magma, magma intrusions that cross-cut layers in a stratigraphic section. A pegmatite is a form of a dike that has big coarse crystals in it. Um, beryl would be like a, an accessory mineral. It would be in there in small quantities. Most pegmatites are big hunkin quartz and feldspar crystals usually, maybe with some big micas, the muscovite or biotite. Uh, it's usually just a couple, two or three minerals and not very many more. And tourmaline kind of, this also occurs in pegmatites. So another accessory mineral in, so it comes in small quantities in igneous and metamorphic rocks. I've seen it in both places. And it does not look like this when you look down the microscope, that's for sure. Okay. The chain silicates. So these are, there are two chain silicates. I've got, um, I should say, I should dis distinguish these. These are single chain, single chain silicates versus the amphiboles, which are the double chain. I want to make sure that you know the difference. The pyroxenes, um, I showed you augite as an example. Here's some really beautiful, pristine, like museum quality augites. Um, here's another pyroxene. Believe it or not, it is um, the same mineral group as the black augites, but it's pink because of the lithium. So the chemical, the, the trace elements, sometimes these elements like lithium can cause a certain color to appear in the minerals. And it's simply just the way that the mineral absorbs or doesn't absorb certain wavelengths of light. Pyroxenes like augite are found in all kinds of different rocks. They're found in um, metamorphic and igneous rocks, but usually just igneous rocks. And it's a black mineral, it's a dark mineral, so it's usually in more higher quantities in the mafic rocks, like basalt. You definitely find augite and basalt. Um, basalt's fine grain because it's volcanic, right? Compared to gabbro, which is its plutonic chemical equivalent. In gabbro, objects would be big enough to see with your naked eye or with, you know, with your hand, the, the hand lens. Um, in, a, in a basalt, you would have to look down the microscope to actually see those. Unless, unless it's a phenocryst, we'll get to these terms, but I mean, I want you to start just using them. Um, unless it's a phenocryst, one of those crystals that's very early formed. I showed you a hornblende andesite before that was kind of a gray hunk of rock with black, um, black elongate crystals in it. That would uh, of hornblende. Um, you might see them as those larger crystals showing up in a, a fine grain matrix of the volcanic rock. Okay, so pyroxenes are the single chain, and, and those all have cleavage that intersect, cleavage planes that intersect at 90 degrees. Um, the double chain silicates are the minerals that have two cleavages that intersect at 60 or 120 degrees um, angles. And this is a comparison down here to show you the double chain with the 6120 angle. So 60 degrees comes from this angle to the horizontal. Here to here is 60 degrees. And actually, no, that should be 30 degrees because that's 30, because that should make 180. 
30, 50. Yeah, so that should be 30 degrees. So 60 would derive from if there was an equal plane on this side and it would be double that. 60 degrees there or 120 there, depending on what part of the crystal you're looking at. Um, let's see, these are also the dark minerals. It's also common, more common in mafic rocks, but amphiboles are, pyroxenes outnumber the amphiboles in like basalts and gabbros. It's sort of the intermediate composition rocks that have more amphiboles than pyroxenes. And you also see them in, in granites too. So they kind of occur across the board, across the chemistries from felsic to mafic. And it's kind of a, just a trash can of elements here. It's, it's almost got a little bit of everything. Calcium, sodium, iron, magnesium, aluminum, just all over the place. And it's a hydrous mineral too. So hornblende, if that was in, let's say a gr granitoid rock, meaning anything from like a gabbro to a granite, anything like that, a plutonic rock, um, this would definitely transform to break down to form pyroxene, which is anhydrous. The high, the sorry, the hydroxyl group in the horn blend would break down, form water, give off water, and then its new structure would be like a, a pyroxene structure during metamorphism. Okay, what else? Glaucophane, this is the one that is a blue or a violet colored mineral. Hornblende is generally pretty black. Um, the glaucophane, I don't know if you can kind of see its lavendery color. Um, it's a pretty mineral. It, you just don't often get lar like really large glaucophane minerals. Okay, so there are the chain silicates, the sheet silicates, the micas I've introduced you to, so muscovite, which is a silvery color or kind of colorless even, if you were to look at a single sheet, if it was a bunch of, if it was like, they call it, they're called books. If you get like a whole book of mica where it's a bunch of sheets all stacked together. And I mean, these are like little small books, but if you were, they come in big clumps too, especially in like pegmatitic granitic rocks. Uh, they look more silvery. The biotite, it also kind of um, oxidizes and so it might, it, yours look really nice, but in places you might see like a rusty red color, like along the edges or along the little fractures. That's where it's oxidizing a little bit. That's in any mineral that contains iron and magnesium, you might get some oxidation like that. Um, okay, what else? Uh, the clay minerals are part of the, the sheet silicates. So two examples, kaolinite. I don't think you have kaolinite in here. Um, here's another example, montmorillonite, it's just pretty. These are hydrous aluminum bearing silicate, the uh, sheet silicates that can form from the breakdown of just like weathering breakdown of feldspars. And uh, when clays form like that from weathering processes and other rocks, uh, it makes the other rocks like lose their structural coherence. Like they, they get weaker, they start to fall apart because the minerals are degrading. These are also hydrous minerals, the OH, and this one even has some structural water in it. Um, these would definitely contribute to the the water that manages, that buoyantly rises out of a subducting crust and enter the mantle wedge and lower the, man, the melting temperature of those mantle peridotites or peroxinites. Um, muscovite and biotite are kind of all over the place. They, they're found in lots of different rock types. So it's just a good mineral to, to know. Um, some more sheet silicates. So chlorite is, it's almost like a green mica. This happens to be uh, muscovite that's covered in a lot of green chloride. So this is the muscovite there and the green chloride. 
Chlorite's also a breakdown product. Like when biotite becomes unstable in its pressure, wherever it, pressure temperature conditions the rock is at, chlorite starts to grow in its place. So look, it's got iron, magnesium, silicon, silica, aluminum. Um, the biotite's the same. It's iron, magnesium, silica, aluminum. They're almost the same. Uh, so it's a lot easier for chlorite to, it's easy for it to replace the biotype. That's big. I'm not picking her up because she's like 30 pounds. If she manages to get up here, then you get to see big. <laughs> um, serpentine. So serpentine is the mineral uh, that, serpent, that forms serpentinite. Serpentinite is the rock serpentine is the mineral it's one of my pet peeves actually people call serpentinite the rock serpentine Ugh, drives me nuts it, and i hear it all the time because we've got so much serpentinite you see serpentinite all up and down highway 280 when you're driving um it's in the beaches like baker beach um, if you've been down there, that's the beach that is sort of under the Golden Gate on the Pacific side of San Francisco. Beware if you go down there. I, I'll tell you a little quick story. I, I did not know about what Baker Beach is besides a beach. And I took a field trip of students down there when I was a, a new professor at San Francisco State. And um, I took them down there to see all the rocks because there's a bunch of Franciscan complex rocks. It's like serpentinite and some metamorphic rocks. And I think there's some chertz down there and some gray wackies, which are like a sandstone, a dirty sandstone. Well, I was, students were sitting like at the, on the rocks at the beach. And I was standing on the ocean side, facing them, facing the rocks. They were facing the ocean. And I'm talking to them about the Franciscan complex and talking about the rocks and tectonics and all that. And I didn't know that there were naked men passing behind me the whole time. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a nude beach. It's also um, a gay nude beach. So the students had a, got an eyeful <laughs> about that field trip. Oh, well, I haven't taken a field trip back there since then. I wonder why. Okay, so serpentine chloride, talc. T is, you have talc in your, your boxes. I think that's talc. It doesn't, wait, it doesn't feel exactly like talc. I'm gonna look real quick. Number 10 is talc. Yeah, that's 10, all right. It's kind of a grayish rock. It doesn't look a whole lot, like a lot of, um, it doesn't look like much. It looks like a gray hunk, but you can see the sheets that form that are the part of the sheet silicate, like the micas, I'm right, the micas there. It's not as finely layered as the muscovite and biotite. Um, it should sort of have a greasy feel. Mine does a little bit. Hopefully yours are a little bit greasier, but feel it with your in your thumb like this. And it, it should kind of have, I'm breaking mine. It should have a, like a greasy feel to it. Um, it's a really soft mineral. So you should be able to scratch it with your fingernail. That's another, all, I think all the sheet silicates that's true of, um, but you can try it now, scratch it with your fingernail and you can see a mark that's left behind. Um, that tells you something about its hardness. That's one of the physical properties that we'll test. And actually using your fingernails, because your fingernails are about um, hardness 2.5 on the Mohs scale, it's a handy tool. <laughs> handy. <laughs> Get it? So punny. Okay. My daughter would enjoy that one. She's a big fan of puns. Okay. The framework silicates. You know, I can't hear you. The one thing that I, I miss is, as far as teaching is concerned is getting feedback from you all because you're all like basically muted and you're sitting there with your cameras on or off and, but you're looking at me, right? And hearing these stories. I hope you're laughing at some of my dumb jokes or my stories. <laughs> okay. Um, 
tech, the framework silicates. I mentioned quartz. So quartz comes in lots of colors, purple, pink, brown, yellow, um, black, gray. I'm trying to think of all the names. There, you know, this is called, like when it's pink, it's given a name rose quartz or smoky quartz if it's gray or citrine if it's yellow. To me, as far as this class is concerned, it's all just quartz because we're not doing gemstones in here, we're doing minerals. So they're all silica. And if they have a color, it's because they've got like, they've acquired some tiny amount of some other element that gives it that color. And then a bunch of feldspars. And I put a bunch of different examples of feldspar. Usually feldspars are kind of like white, solid, like blocky. When I say blocky, think of like building blocks, like a child's building blocks. They're squarish or rectangular-ish in that way. Opaque, so light doesn't pass through them. Um, and white usually, or just off-white. But there are some feldspars, like this is called amazonite. This is a microcline feldspar. It's, a, it's one of the potassium feldspars. Uh, okay, so on here I put, the, I'll explain this diagram in a second. It's one of the, it's not a plagioclase, it's a potassium feldspar. This is also what microcline looks like. It can be pink. It can also be white. Labradorite is a kind of plagioclase and um, sometimes it has this iridescence to it that's really beautiful. And in fact, um, a lot of times people will have like kitchen counters or bathroom counters made out of Labradorite. Um, oftentimes it's a rock that comes out of Norway where they mine it um, because it's the rock itself is just full of this Labradorite. Okay, this diagram is called it, we call them ternary diagrams because there are three corners. Uh, it represents potassium, calcium, and sodium on each of its corners. And so this represents like the mixing of the, those elements, those ions, the potassium, sodium, and calcium. And each corner, like this corner where it says anorthite, that's just the name of, that we give the feldspar that has like 90% to 100% calcium and less than 10% sodium. Uh, and let's see. I've just seen that my charger fell out of its spot. I hope that we last, I last. Um, sodium, if it's a sodium corner, albite is the name that we give that feldspar. Uh, you don't need to learn that here. If you take my mineralogy petrology class as a major, then you will learn these. And then the, this is also known as AKA, the potassium feldspars or the alkali feldspars. So we call them K feldspars or K spars or alkali feldspars too. It just means that it's got potassium and sodium and not calcium is all it means. So orthoclase and microcline are on this potassium end. That's these three here. Labradorite's right here. So it's a mixture of calcium and sodium in it but that's a plagioclase. So these are all the plagioclases and they get different names. And I'm kind of showing you this also in case you run across those different feldspar names, then you, you know where to go to look them up. Um, it, it can get really confusing, right? Because it would be, it seems like it would be enough to say it's a plagioclase feldspar, but then we give them these names to break down like whether it's like mostly calcium or mostly sodium. Okay, uh, that's all I want to say about that. Most, uh, yeah, there basically isn't a mixture with the, the potassium feldspars. They're only going to have a tiny amount of calcium if they have any. That's how you read this. And then this means that like basically there's nothing that falls in there. Okay, the non-silicate minerals. Um, those include lots of different examples. Gypsum, you have gypsum. You've got, you've got three different gypsum examples in your kits. It seems like a lot of gypsum. I wish they had put in some other minerals. But you've got, um, 
it is numbers number, sorry, nine, 14, and 15. So there's 14. This is given a name called satin spar. It has a satiny, a satiny um, sheen to it or luster is the name we give it. Here's 15. It looks a little different. It doesn't have like these striations on the outside that 14 does. Um, and what I say, nine or six? No, not nine. Oh, interesting. And then they gave uh, this, so the nine, you'll see it, the sixes and the nines look the same, but there's a little line underneath to show you which way is down. So the nine should have the line underneath it. And the six, the six also has the line underneath it, but then the number is the right way up. So you put the line on the bottom. This one is the six. Unfortunately, it looks a lot like it actually it doesn't look a lot like the nine. So nine looks like this. Six looks like this. Okay. I have a question about the gypsum. Yeah, you bet. So um, you said number 14 is called satin spar. Yes, it's also gypsum though. I've seen it often sold in rock shops as selenite. Um, but then I see that 15 is selenite, but I've seen what looks like satin spars 15. sold as selenite. 15, yeah. So don't trust rock shops. <laughs> trust your, your handy local mineralogist. Rock shops is, and or online shops like Amazon, eBay, it's all lies. <laughs> you have to be really careful. There is a lot, there are a lot of fake minerals that they sell online and you've got to be careful. You need to look closely and make sure that they're not giving you, like they make up, they coat minerals with a thin coat of metal and it gives it like a, an iridescent sheen and they call it like um, some, what's it, quartz? It's like, astro quartz or some crazy name like that it's not it's just quartz with me a metal coating it's not even a mineral um so this is the satin spar this is what it should look like the fibrous one the the one that not not fibrous more these are like striations these mm -hmm. don't come off as fibers so i wouldn't call it fiber fibrous i would call these striations instead yeah, the striated one um, is the satin spar. Okay, because years ago I bought um, like a foot long piece of what was labeled a selenite, but I guess it's satin spar after seeing the uh, little sample. Yeah, selenite. I, I right. I remember that term too. I I wonder. Let me. I'm just looking up the definition really quick. It's also, it's the same, it says it's the same name. Selenite, or at least according, I think this might be Wikipedia, but I go, yeah, this is, but Wikipedia actually does a pretty good job with minerals and rocks, actually, and geology in general. So don't be afraid to use Wikipedia to look this stuff up. It says selenite is also known as satin spar. I think that's because they're gypsum, not because... It says, is also known as satin spar, desert ro rose, or gypsum flower. Um, they're describing a lot of different things. They're describing basically all these types. So I don't think, I don't think that's the best definition. I'm going to have to get back to you. I'm going to write that one down, the selenite, because... Um, I'm not sure the correct usage of that. Okay. But I'll let you know, okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, one thing to notice, you'll be able to see it easily on this piece, on number 15. Uh, gypsum is also soft and you can scratch it with your fingernail. So, um, I mean, don't ruin your specimen. I don't recommend it, but you could take like a little corner and scratch it with your fingernail to see that you leave a mark. 
So its hardness is quite soft. Its hardness is soft. Um, that's really helpful for the soft minerals because then you can identify them pretty easily. Okay, back to where we were. Okay, non-silicates. Gypsum is one of them. It's a sulfate mineral. It's not a silicate. So the the formulas, well, the the those the sol the groups, the sulfates are all contain a, a sulfur and oxygen group at the end of their formulas. Um, there are oxide minerals like hematite is one that you'll come across. And I um, number three is hematite in yours. Mine is not a great hematite. It looks like this. It doesn't look like the picture. So hematite can come in a couple different varieties. It might look red. Imagine that picture of the hematite. It might look all red like that, or imagine it covered with the more silvery metallic looking that side. It can also look like that. So it has a different uh, appearances, different colors. Never trust color when it comes to identifying minerals. It can be helpful, but no, don't trust it alone. Uh, right, but the streak is the same for the hematite. So we should be able to identify it as hematite using the streak and the streak plate, the little, um, the little ceramic plate that I talked to you about. Okay, carbonates. So calci calcite is a carbonate mineral. It has a distinctive rhombohedral shape, so it's not rectangular. It's a rectangle that's angled a little bit. So it forms a rhombohedron. That's really helpful in identifying the calcite. And calcite's also, that's how you're gonna identify, that's what you're gonna use your acid for, is to identify any rock or mineral that is a carbonate, that, that is calcite. Or maybe dolomite. Dolomite sometimes works. Dolomite you see often in just people's yards. If you ever see white rock in like in the sidewalk strip of somebody's house, um, oftentimes it'll be like, they use a lot of basalt, like red basalt, like oxidized basalt rocks in gardening like that. And they also use a lot of um, dolomite. Dolomite is, um, instead of calcium carbonate, it's calcium magnesium carbonate and it can fizz particularly if you powder it a little bit. Um, fluorite comes, this is a mineral that has four cleavage planes, so that's fun. It comes as a, a cube mineral or as an octahedron, so a, a pyramid on top and a pyramid on bottom to form, form an eight-sided structure or form. Um, these are fall in the halide minerals. Uh, sulfides include pyrite, fool's gold is pyrite. I don't think you have pyrite. Oh, wait, you do. Number four, you've got some pyrite in your kit. So it is not, not the beautiful little, it's not a beautiful large cube, but if you look with your magnifying glass, I'm cheating, I'm using my, my hand lens just because that's what I use. But if you look with your magnifying glass right now, hopefully, pull it out, look closely and I see very small cubes, or in some cases they look hexagonal on their end. And I see that they also have a lot of little striations, like little stripes on the sides, on the crystal faces, on the sides of the mineral. So look closely at that one and you should see cubes or something close to it. The native elements like gold, silver, copper, um, those are also uh, minerals but those only have uh, one element. They, they are not ions, they're just, it's just gold, AU, or silver, AG, the periodic table abbreviations. So there are a bunch of other minerals in, that are non-silicates. We will study some of them, but most of the minerals that form the rocks that we'll study are silicate minerals. Okay, here we go. Um, I can't, this is a longer list than you'll actually really use for all these minerals. You're going to use some of these properties to test the minerals that you've got in your kits. 
Uh, let's talk about each of them and then I'll give you some examples. Okay. Um, habit. Habit is the word, the term that we use to describe the shape. Like the, it's different from the form of the mineral because the form can be like one of those um, quartz points. I pulled up this, you know, this is the form of the mineral. It's habit, you would call this prismatic because they form little prisms. Um, that's this term in the middle here, prismatic. You know, the, the, the feldspars, I keep telling you, I would call blocky. That's the name of the habit. Um, it could be fibrous. You don't have any fibrous minerals, I don't think. Um, but fibrous would be a habit. Uh, bladed, like my kyanite that's a bladed habit. Um, it also, a mineral might be needle-like too. So this is the shape that the mineral has grown in, essentially. And there are lots of terms for habit, like you could describe the habit of a, you know, one of those rounded garnets. If it's not a dodecahedron, like if it hasn't grown in that nice prismatic shape, you can just call it rounded and that's a habit. Hardness is an important one. Uh, oftentimes, that's kind of what we're left with as far as the physical properties. Like the hard, it boils down to hardness, and that's going to tell the difference between one mineral or another. Um, this is based on something called Mohs scale, and Mohs scale goes from one to ten, and we use these scratch tests for it. Um, that, sorry, I've got a plug in. Excuse me for a second. I've got to plug in my um, thing. You know what? I got to take this all the way across the room, actually, and plug it in, or else I'm going to lose you guys. All right. I thought I had it plugged in before class, but it when I set up my computer, it pushed it out. Come on, reach. All right. It reaches. Excellent. Now just don't pull the computer off the desk. Okay. Here we go. Now we're safe. Okay, so physical properties. Hardness, that's a most scale. So we use this, the, uh, the glass plate, your fingernail, a knife blade, um, other minerals of known hardnesses. Like quartz is a good... Um, Quartz is known to have a hardness of seven, and so you can use quartz to test other minerals to find out if it's a less, less than a seven on the hardness scale or more than a seven. The color is another one, um, or it could be a range of colors for different minerals. Um, the cleavage, so those are these planes of weaknesses, and I've used the micas to describe, uh-oh, I lost my mica. So I've used my, the, biotite and the muscovite to describe these planes of weakness. Um, and I've shown you the cleavage plane on the feldspar as well. Fracture. Fracture is how a mineral breaks. So not on a cleavage plane. This would be minerals that don't have cleavages, how they break, or um, the edges, the places on the other minerals that do have cleavage, places where the cleavage isn't expressed, like how those parts of the minerals break. Uh, and oftentimes that can be, oftentimes it's just irregular, unless it's like a fibrous or a splintery kind of mineral, or you might get a conchoidal fracture. I'll, I'll give you an example, but it looks like glass. When glass breaks, you know, it has that scooped out curved look to it. Um, that's a conchoidal fracture. Or if you forget the term, just say a glass-like fracture. L uh, luster is important. Luster, you start off a basic, a basic difference is like uh, metallic versus non-metallic. I'm trying to get these in focus. Okay, so the pyrite has a metallic luster. The feldspar does not have, this is a non-metallic luster. So it doesn't have a sheen like gold, silver, copper, any kind of metallic sheen like that. Number one, it tells you that there are metallic bonds in the mineral that distinguish it from non-metallic um, minerals. 
And um, so that's your first breakdown. And then, and then the, for the non-metallic minerals, you also um, can describe them as, as having a glassy luster, an earthy luster, silky, like the, um, the satin spar, I would describe as silky, or the, that Labradorite was iridescent. Transparency is whether a mineral is opaque versus transparent. Is that transparent? A little bit. The gypsum number 15 is a little bit transparent. You can see th things through it. It's not just light passing through it. The satin spar, I would say, is translucent. Light comes through. So 14, light comes through. That's translucent. 15 is somewhat transparent. And then the feldspar, number two, is opaque. You can't see through it at all. Streak. That's where that little plate comes in, the little ceramic plate. So the streak is the color of the powdered mineral. So what you do is you literally scratch the mineral across the streak plate, and it turns out in this case, the feldspar is harder than the streak plate, so I'm not getting any powdered mineral. It's nothing. So the mineral has to be softer than the streak plate in order to powder it on here. That's one another test. So you can use the streak plate actually as a um, as part of a hardness test too. Solubility in acid. So we call this the fizz test. And I ask students, did you fizz it to try that? Meaning, did you put a drop of hydrochloric acid on it? That's your little dropper bottle that you got in the box from us. Um, if you were to pull up the calcite number six from your box, you could drop a small, and you can try this now if you want, drop one drop of acid or two. Two is okay. It's not going to hurt anything. But if you drop um, one drop of acid onto the calcite, it'll fizz and you'll see bubbles come up. It's carbon dioxide. It's like carbon. Uh, carbonation almost. It's carbon dioxide that comes off from the reaction between the calcium carbonate and the hydrogen and chloride of the hydrochloric acid. It gives off carbon dioxide gas. That tells us that it confirms that this is calcite when you see the fizz, the fizzing. Specific gravity or density, this is one that um, that you're only going to be able to use on your your actual mineral you you obviously can't do all of these virtually some of these tests need to be done um, in person so the specific gravity is something you need to feel how dense how heavy a mineral is so if you feel eight and four so eight is your magnetite it's magnetic. If you hold a magnet to it or a paper clip, I don't have a paper clip handy to try it. But if it's magnetic enough, a paper clip should be attracted to it, or certainly the magnet that I sent, we sent you. These both have a, a metallic sheen to them, and they're both really dense. So the specific gravity is a lab test. You have to like actually measure like how much water it displaces and how the mass of the mineral and all that. We're just gonna use a relative test. Like does it feel heavy or does it feel light? So you compare, compare your selenite 14 to pyrite four. Feel those in your hand. The pyrite is much, has a much heavier feel to it. And they're about the same size, right? They're about the same size. So for the same size mineral, the selenite is really lightweight compared to the pyrite. That's a density measurement. So the pyrite's dense. It has a, a much higher specific gravity than the selenite. Tenacity, you're not gonna be able to test that for most minerals, but tenacity is how flexible the mineral is. So you might be able to see like on the edges of your mica or your biotite, I don't want you to break them too much. Some will flake off, but you'll see that they're flexible sheets. 
that's where ten tenacity comes in. Um, some minerals can actually, like the, the gold and silver can be malleable or even um, ductile, but we're mostly dealing with flexible for the micas or brittle as far as like all the others, like feldspar, that's brittle. You're not gonna break, flex, it's not gonna be flexible. The presence of striations. So we've seen striations on the, the, the satin spar, the number 14. And also if you use your hand, the magnifying glass, you can see striations on the pyrite in number four, probably. I don't know your exact specimen, but yeah, you should be able to. Magnetic, and that's just like the striations are just something that happens as the mineral grows. Uh, and it's just a, one of those features that you, they, some minerals have it and others don't. And so you can use it to tell them apart. Magnetic attraction. Most minerals are not magnetized or not magnetic, but some are, and you have magnetite. It's a pretty common mineral, but usually just small pieces in your rock. Um, you'll see that that attracts. Uh, Taste. You don't have any minerals that I would suggest licking, but literally some, oh wait, you do. 11. Lick number 11, since they're your own samples. Jesus. Mm, it's really salty. It's high, it's, this is halite. So this is um, sodium chloride, it's salt. And it has a nice square, nice cubic form to it. Okay, so there are other minerals that you could taste. There's a big hunk of glue on mine as well um, that help you to, to tell them apart. So if you're having trouble identifying, you know, you have a bunch of sort of colorless or white minerals that all sort of look similar, especially like these two, the gypsum and the halite, and they're both pretty soft too. Like if you were to lick them, you could tell them apart. Um, if they're mineral twins or the feel, I told you to feel the um, to feel the talc. That's number ten. The feel can also be something that you use to distinguish minerals. So this is not all of the the properties that you can use, but this is like a lot of them. And I'm going to explain a little bit in the last few minutes. I can't believe that this is we're still I'm still on these slides. <laughs> <laughs> I talk so much. Um, let's try to run through these last ones fairly quickly where I explain, you know, why or how some of these properties work. So the properties that are primarily controlled by the atomic arrangement or the kind of bonding that takes place in the mineral include the hardness, the tenacity. So magnetite is magnetic. That's one double refraction. If you have like a really clear piece of calcite, you get this double refraction where you see like two copies of words when you hold it over some text. It means it sends light in two different ways or it's bending light in two ways. The habit, so that that's like the shape. So here's striations on the pyrite that I was talking about. You should be able to see that on your specimen. The density is another one. Tenacity is that flexibility. Um, properties that are primarily controlled by the kinds of atoms. So that might mean like um, that contribute to the color. I told you that depends on like iron and magnesium in the garnet to give it a dark color. Tourmaline. Um, we've got sulfur that has a, a distinct smell to it. Um, Calcite fizzes, so solubility in acid. Uh, fluorescence, so some minerals give off light or fluoresce under certain wavelengths of light. Um, and then the density, also the specific gravity. Some properties are controlled by light, so like the luster, um, whether a mineral has a glassy luster, so it's very shiny on that cleavage face. The streak also, so the powdered, um, the powdered color of the mineral, its transparency, so whether you can see light through the crystal, um, whether minerals are tarnished, you won't run across that really in this, or iridescence, that's another one. 
luster i we're just on the last gosh oh my gosh there's still so many how is that possible okay i talked about metallic and non-metallic luster so that's the first breakdown is it metallic looking is it non-metallic if it's non-metallic then we have a bunch of different terms that we can use to describe like iridescence a pearly luster a uh, a resinous is supposed to be like amber or um, glassy or a gem like luster. Those are all ways we can classify those. The habit, um, habit, oh, I just lost my number off my gypsum. I'm gonna have to glue that back. The habit is the shape. And so here are a bunch of different shapes. So cubic, um dendritic you're not going to have those bladed like kyanite rhombohedral like uh, calcite octahedral like fluorite prismatic like tourmaline um, blocky like the feldspars dodecahedral like garnet um, prismatic there's another example like quartz prisms striated is another example color is not a, a reliable property. I put a big arrow there because that's important. It is not reliable. I'm gonna ask you this question on an exam, I promise. You can't trust color to identify the minerals, period. And lots of minerals like this, these are all corundum, all of these gemstones down at the bottom. If, if, um, if corundum, has any sort of blue, purple, or pinkish color to it, it's called a sapphire. If it's got a, a yellow, if it's got a, an orange or a red color to it, it's called a ruby. And there's a whole rainbow of colors that you can get that just depend on what tiny amounts of different elements have made it their way into the crystal. Here's some examples. So it's usually like these trace elements, so tiny percentages of minerals or elements that produce the color. Chromium gives a, a, an orange red color to this crocoite, cro <clears throat> um, or it might be crocoite. I'm not really sure how to pronounce that one. Chromium gives the green color, oops, I didn't change that to green. I added fuchsite, the green color of fuchsite. Uh, you could pronounce that differently probably, but I think it was probably someone who had the last name Fuchs, the German name. That uh, This is a mica mineral too, so you can have green micas if you've got chromium in them. Iron gives the red color of limonite or of uh, some garnets. Manganese gives the pink color to the rhodochrosite and a pinkish color to garnets too. Copper produces a blue color in azurite or the green color of malachite. I don't have a picture of malachite up here. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that the, the elements that contribute to these different color minerals are usually the transition metals. So the purple zone in here. So cobalt, chromium, nickel, copper, manganese, these are all just aqueous solutions of those um, elements. So um, the, these elements are the ones that contribute to the color. Streak. So streak is when you um, scratch the mineral across a streak plate. These are two kinds of hematite there, specular hematite and just like the, the, the one that looks sort of metallic and a one that looks more earthy. And they give, they should give a pretty similar, it's not the same, but it's a similar reddish brown streak. Uh, pyrite that has a brass yellow color to it, a metallic yellow color, gives a black streak. Those are reliable indicators. The streak is not the same thing as the color. The powdered color of the streak that you get is reliable. Density or specific gravity is, um, let's see, I, I just wanted to say the metallic minerals have a, a higher specific gravity or higher density than non-metallic. And um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about that was that 
It's a feel. Is it high density, low density? It's just a relative sense. We're not going to do any measurements with that one. The specific gravity actually increases with um, the, chemi the chemistry of the mineral. So the atomic weight of the cations, so the these are all ca um, carbonate minerals here, and these are all sulfate minerals here. And just by changing the cation from calcium to lead, you increase the density in a lot in that mineral. So you go from a density of 2.95 to a density of 6.55 or here, anhydrite to anglesite, 2.98 to 6.38. They're all the same structure. Almost, you know, they would behave very similarly in their physical properties, but the density is really controlled by which elements. So the higher the atomic number, the, the higher the density of those minerals. Hardness. Stop me if I'm going too fast, but we're going to come back to these and use these in the lab. Uh, hardness is uh, a more reliable, not better, one of the more reliable, one of the, how about more reliable physical properties of minerals. It's related to the atomic structure of the mineral. So um, if the minerals have a strong, strong covalent bonds, they'll be harder on most scale than if they have more weak bonds or ionic bonds. Um, some softer minerals have metallic bonds even. You test these through the scratch test. You scratch either with your fingernail, with a knife or a glass, or it might be a steel file. You don't necessarily have all of those, um, but you've got glass, you've got a street plate, you've got, this should be street plate. Street plate or a steel knife, those both have a, um, a hardness between about 6.5 and 7. But quartz also, if you have a piece of quartz, you know that that's a hardness of 7 on most scales. So you can use the quartz as a, a testing material. So these, you, you've got several minerals in your kits that are on Mohs hardness scale. You have talc, that is a hardness of 1. That's um, number 10. You have gypsum. You have three gypsums that are a hardness of two. You've got calcite that is three on most scale. You have fluorite. Mine looks like this. It's chunky and white, but it has sort of a prismatic shape to it. You can kind of see four sides. It is, the hardness should be just fine, but it's usually more transparent than this fluorite is. But um, even though it doesn't look the same, the hardness should be reliable. You don't have any apatite, that's a five. Orthoclase, um, this is a microcline, I believe. Microcline, yes, this is a microcline feldspar, not orthoclase. But an, a white feldspar that is an orthoclase would be a six. You have quartz, that's a seven. Topaz is an eight. Corundum, so ruby and sapphire, you don't use ruby and sapphire, you use corundum, like you can get some junky corundum that's just um, hard, or maybe it's like junky ruby or sapphire. I found sapphire in the Ural Mountains when I was doing my PhD field research. That was pretty awesome. There are a lot of, a lot of minerals come out of the Ural Mountains. Um, so it's blue, it was hexagonal, it wasn't gem quality for sure. Diamond is the um, most hardness of 10. So th this is the hardest natural substance, diamond. Um, so there you go. There are the index minerals for Mohs scale. And you have some things, including your glass plate, your streak plate. I think you have a nail, or there should have been a nail that came with your kits, I thought. Mine doesn't have it. Uh, you can use a, like a, well, the street plate and the glass will do most, and your fingernail, that takes care of most of the hardness testing, honestly. Um, anyway, we'll use those things to test hardness, any identified minerals you can use against other minerals. Tenacity. Okay, so here's some just examples 
um, we're not going to be able to test all of these with our specimens. But biotite and muscovite are fairly flexible. They're like this, like the chloride is another mica group mineral. They can be bent, but they're not, you're not going to like, like they're not malleable like metals can be where you can hammer them into thin sheets. Um, feldspar is and quartz are brittle, so they break or they powder easily. They're, they don't, they're not flexible. Um, silver can even be, like some things can be cut into thin shavings or they can be um, bent or stretched into a wire like silver. Those don't apply to a lot of ours. Gypsum, I suppose, that's a sectile mineral, but I'm not gonna have you destroy your specimens. Okay, where are we? Here, cleavage. Okay. Some examples of cleavage. Cleavage is, remember, that the planes that the minerals break along flat planes. So uh, feldspars, uh, pyroxenes, and, and amphiboles like augite and hornblende all have two cleavage planes that intersect at a known angle. So the feldspars, in, those cleavage planes intersect at 90 degrees, augite at 90 degrees, hornblende at 120 or 60 degrees. Micas only have one plane, so here's a muscovite. That's its one plane of cleavage. Um, calcite and halite, so the salt, have three planes. So you can imagine one plane here, another plane on the front, and another plane on the side. Fluorite has four. So here's one, two, three, and backside is four different planes. This sphalerite has six. I'm not going to count those. Most don't have six. So the most you're going to see are four cleavage planes in your specimens that you've got. Usually this is something that you're observing. We're not actually breaking the mineral specimens in class, but that's how you would actually test it is to break them with a hammer or something. I wanted to give like a diagram that showed how those planes intersect. So that's where this comes from. And I gave you an example of several. So here's the four cleavages of fluorite. One, two, three, four on the back side. It's the same on the bottom. So this plane is the same as that plane. This plane is the same as that plane. Um, calcite has three, so one, the top is two, the side is three. Same with the halite, you've got one, two, three there. So you give a cubic cleavage. So this is three cleavages that intersect at 90 degrees and this is not at 90 degrees. It's different ways of describing them. Here's two cleavages that these intersect at 90, but not all of them do. Um, so they might be like the horn blends, the amphiboles are two planes that intersect not at 90. The micas all have one cleavage plane that is described as a perfect cleavage because it's so shiny. And then quartz, believe it or not, has no cleavage. Even though you see all these nice crystal faces, that's just its crystal form. It doesn't actually break like that. When you break quartz, it actually has a conchoidal fracture like glass. Fracture. Uh, here's the conchoidal fracture I was talking about. So a glassy curved shape like this, or the, the little um, broken parts of, the, of a flint arrowhead. Quartz has a conchoidal fracture too. So glass and quartz, I don't see the conchoidal quite so well here. Or you might have a, a, a fibrous fracture. A lot of um, minerals, though, have an irregular fracture. Like if I were to break the feldspar, you can see the bro broken faces in some cases, and it's just irregular. It, it, you know, it's, it's uneven. You're not going to see a lot of twinning, but this is, oh, we can make it to the end. You hang there with me, and we'll make it to the end, and then um, I can look at the, the lab page with you in a second. Um, twinning. So you might see, if you had plagioclase, you would see these little, they're not striations, they look kind of like striations, but these are actually twins. If you look down the microscope, they look like this. Um, 
there's the white parts are one twin and the black parts are another twin. So it's really an intergrowth of two minerals, two crystals into that are sharing plane structure or crystallographic planes. So they share ions. Here's a calcite twin. Here's a starlight twin. That's where they're actually two separate crystals that you can identify as two different crystals. Just a different kind of twinning. I mentioned taste. So halite, you've tasted maybe now. Um, I Try it just so that you can see what I'm talking about. Sylvite is sim similar. It's a potassium chloride. And in fact, some people I think use sylvite when if they have to watch their salt, I think they use sylvite because it it, it doesn't have the sodium um, as far as like the, the salt intake. There are other minerals that we are not going to taste and that we're not going to encounter in our labs that have different kinds of tastes, but you got to watch out when you're licking minerals. Some can be poisonous. None that you have. Acid solubility. So the fizz test, when you drop, put a drop or two of acid on your calcite, it should bubble up like this. Um, calcite doesn't always look white or colorless. It might look like all of these, pink, yellow, blue, green. Dolomite looks like this. That's the yard rock I was talking about. Um, it sort of looks like microcrystalline. It's got all these little shiny specks in it. That's not purely calcium carbonate. So you might have to like, scratch some off powder a little bit with a, a, a nail, not at your fingernail, but a, a steel nail or like a knife blade, and then you can fizz it to see. Then magnetic attraction. Here's our final one. Magnetite has a magnetic attraction. If, it, if it's a good piece of magnetite, you ought to be able to stick things to it. Let's see if I can find anything that might work it's handy around here. Um, no, I'm not finding things that are iron. So um, your magnet certainly will. Some other minerals, like sometimes uh, chromite or pyrotite might have a weak magnetic attraction. So watch out, especially when you're looking dealing with rocks. Sometimes they might have a mineral in them that is magnetic, and that doesn't mean that the whole thing is magnetite or that it's all a magnetic mineral. They, there are other minerals in there. Phew. Okay, I did it. I'm, a, I'm after time, but we have gotten through our slides. Um, can I answer any questions about these? I want to just show you the website real quick before we say goodbye. Um, could you actually go back to the first um, specific gravity um, slide, please? Yes. This one? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Are you just taking notes? Okay, I will get the, um, I'm going to get the web page ready to roll here. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. Um, I want you to, let's see, if you go to the iLearn page, let me stop sharing this. I'm going to share just quickly. I see that there's something in the chat, but oops, ah, shoot. Can someone read what the, is in the chat for me? Because people were just responding to your um, jokes and humor. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. No, I'll no, that later. no questions. Okay, thank you. So both in your lecture and in your lab folder, I've put links to this website that is um, a fantastic way to study minerals. And we're gonna use this website to study igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks as well. But we're gonna start with minerals. And the first thing I wanted to do was to go to the testing minerals site where you can actually go through and try doing virtual testing of these minerals. And so I'm going to use this in your lab to, you're going to, um, sorry, you're going to apply it to some unknown specimens. Like here are some minerals that are unidentified and you're going to, and I'll give you a subset of these. I'm probably not going to give you all of them because we're combining igneous rocks and minerals. 
Um, I'm going to give you some of these that you're going to test virtually. So you'll be able to do a streak virtually and get an answer. You'll be able to do a hardness test and get an answer. And that will kind of, in a, in a sort of a, um, what are those chart, a flow charts so in a flow chart sort of way, take you to the, a, a, an identified mineral and hopefully you'll be correct. What else did I want to show you? They also have a, a bank of minerals. It's called a visual bank of mineral, a pictures of identified minerals so that you can go through and look at examples and compare these to what the unknowns are. Um, for example, calcite. Uh, it's got, this is, should be a 3D mineral model of calcite that you can rotate and look at to see its cleavage planes, to look, I mean, you can zoom in and, and really see the fact that it's like rhombohedral. It's got these like lean, leaning rhombohedrons, leaning rectangles kind of shapes. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's just one example. Uh, this is, I guess I'll stop there because, um, yeah, because I don't have anything specific ready for you. I will, uh, here, how to identify an unknown mineral. This has got a weird, the, I don't understand what's going on at the top. There are some identification tables that this website has created that you can link to. It's a Google spreadsheet that has um, all of the properties of these minerals laid out in a chart. And you'll be able to use that chart to also kind of help yourself identify the different minerals. So that's how we're going to, I mean, these are all identified for you. So you know what they are, right? So these are sort of ones you can test and prove to yourself that you're getting the same answer as you are um, online. But um, I think tomorrow, if anyone wanted, wants to come to study group tomorrow, I'm going to go through this website together and look at some minerals and test some minerals. Or I can answer questions about labs that haven't been completed yet. But I really hope, or I could even answer questions that you have before you take the exam. I'm happy to answer those types of questions too. So if you want to stick around now um, for a little bit and ask questions about the, before you take the exam, about the labs, about mineral identification, whatever you like, I'm happy to hang out. So if, um, if you're good and you just want to take off for today, I'll say goodbye. Otherwise, I'll see you either tomorrow or I'll see you Tuesday. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Bye. I've really been enjoying the mineral uh, lectures. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge mineral nerd. And so this is all like very exciting to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Um, good. And you've got some actual minerals to play with, which is always nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a whole shelf full of minerals that I've collected. Oh, over really? The, over the years. Yeah. What are My your dad, favorites? My dad also has a huge collection that um, he's given to me two of various rocks and minerals because my dad was an earth science major and did rock counting for a oh, long really? time. Oh, really? Earth, oh. earth science minor, excuse me. He's a mathematician, but oh, he minored cool. in earth science. But yeah, so I have like a ton of stuff that... Um, That's awesome. What's your, what are yeah. your favorites? Um, I have a really nice specimen of tourmaline with quartz and muscovite mixed on top of it. Ooh. Yeah. Um, here. Um, I also have, um, I think it's called lipidolite. Yeah. Is it purple yeah. or yellow? It's purple and white. Okay. Purple, purple and white, and I think it has some quartz on it. The purple, too. that's from the lipidolite is a lithium bearing mica. So, but, uh, 
You can't really see it well, but this is the tourmaline with the muscovite oh, yeah. and the quartz on it. That's a pegmatite. That's straight out of a pegmatite. So oh, that's cool. what I was talking about being really coarse grained, like big mm -hmm. crystals. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I got this in um, Michigan um, at this uh, rock shop that when we go to visit my dad's family, um, it's in Honor, Michigan, I think. But they have like a great selection of stuff. And then I got this um, lipidolite Ooh. in um, San Francisco. Oh, wow. But it, but it so has a... It is looks that like it has. It looks like it might have a little quartz on it here. Oh, that's quartz for sure. But yeah, it's like purple and white, and then this is a little kind of yellow on Is top. that the lipidolite on top, too? Is the... It, um, it, it might be muscovite. I'm, I'm not sure. Is it yellow or colorless? It's, it's a little yellow. So I think it's lipidolite. Yeah, mm. it, or it might be like an intergrowth of muscovite and lipidolite. Mm -hmm. to explain the color you know mm -hmm. that's really cool Those um, are pretty. in the future once um we have classes on campus I actually have two things that I'm unsure of what they are do you think that at that point like you could I could bring them and you could look at them so students, yeah students bring minerals and rocks to me all the time yeah because I have one thing that was mislabeled um, and my dad and I bought it in Montana and um, it was mislabeled and we think it might be rhodonite, but we aren't completely sure. And since you study this stuff, I figured uh, yeah, we can be able to help. narrow it down anyway. <laughs> so okay. You know, like sometimes the hand specimen isn't enough. Sometimes you need like a chemical analysis. Mm -hmm. using an electron microscope or something like that but i'm happy to give it a shot that's for sure okay thank you yeah you bet yeah I, I just have like a ton of stuff that i've collected and my dad has so much stuff he actually um he went to um college up in um houghton michigan and that's oh, okay. like a uh, copper country uh -huh. and um he has a giant piece of float copper that he bought that's about like Whoa. this large it weighs like four at, at least 20 pounds holy that he got and he would go um pick through um what's it called the rock and stuff that mines um get rid of the tailings yeah yeah he would go rock hounding and go through mine um tailings and stuff and find pieces of like copper and other stuff that's really and cool. minerals yeah yeah he was kind of the one who got me into all of this and really made oh, me want neat. to become yeah. a geologist. Most, both of my girls have already said, no way are they being geologists. <laughs> <laughs> but their dad is also a ge geoscientist, so um, they're getting it from both sides, and that's maybe uh -huh. too much. <laughs> Scared them uh -huh. away. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I have applied to the university to try to teach mineralogy petrology in person next semester. I don't know if they're going to approve it or not because they're still doing like 99% of the classes online. Mm -hmm. But I've asked to do Earth 420, which is MinPet 1, mm -hmm. um, to have the lab on campus twice a week. We would still do like a lecture online and stuff like that. But, oh my God, that would be so much better if we could do lab on campus. So you won't be teaching it in the fall then? It would be in the spring? Uh, I, it's, every, it's been every year, so I probably would teach it in the fall again. Yeah. Okay, because on the ed plan that we created, um, I have planned to take uh, Earth 420 in fall of next year. It's flex, you, be flexible with that plan because right now, okay. um, uh, even structural geology is also being offered in the spring and that's usually a fall class mm -hmm. just because we're trying, we're trying to get, we're just trying to teach them in person. If I can't teach mineralogy petrology in person in the spring, um, I'm going to try to do an online version. Mm-hmm. And then I would 
hopefully be able to do the in-person version in the fall. So you're so new to the major, you can wait. You don't have to hurry and take it in the spring if it's online. Okay. Um, so why don't you just wait and see? I, yeah. Just gotta be flexible. Yeah, I'm wondering what, I'm wondering if, yeah, I'm just wondering if I would be able to teach another class like volcanology instead of MIMPET, but I don't know if, because the spring schedule is out already, isn't it? I don't think we can make changes like that. I'm not I sure. I actually haven't looked. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. There are a ton of classes that are being offered in the spring, the majors courses, because, mm -hmm. because it's the usual spring classes and a bunch of people, a bunch of faculty have postponed because we're all just, we were all just hoping that we'd be able to teach face to face. Mm -hmm. So anyway, okay. there, will be, there will be news. Okay. And then we can potentially revise my ed plan as things get like, more clarified we can swap things around you know it's easy to just like move majors courses around from spring to to fall if, mm -hmm. if usually we don't do that because it's always in the fall or always in the spring right mm -hmm. this is just unusual circumstances so of course we can stick with your plan like i said you're early enough in the major that um you have time to wait mm -hmm. okay Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, well, I'm glad you're enjoying the minerals. I, I, I feel badly that we couldn't start a mineral lab this week, but I didn't want to do that to everybody because it, it's mm -hmm. been with the exam and all that. So mm -hmm. I just decided to combine it with igneous rocks. It'll, mm -hmm. We'll have a nice big old lab next week. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a lot of minerals are formed in melts right and so that oh, yeah kind of, for sure that kind of mixes in with the igneous rocks anyways so totally you a lot of the minerals that you've got in your mineral kit um show up in igneous rocks not the gypsum mm -hmm. not the halite but the other ones like magnetite quartz micas uh the feldspar all of those do certainly mm -hmm. so yeah that's how we're gonna tackle it cool okay Right on. Well, you have a good day. You no, too. Oh, do you have more questions? I didn't want to. No, I don't have any you. more questions. Just okay. talking, if anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have any other news. But, um, yeah. So, okay. I, how's the, how is the class going, by the way? How do you think? I, I've been wondering about you, actually, because you've had a class like this before. I don't remember mm -hmm. if you had a lab or not. So. Yeah, I did have a lab. Um, the It's interesting because the class I took at DVC was called Physical Geology and it had a lab, but the transfer equivalent to here, um, SF State, is our dynamic earth. Oh, okay. But um, there's a lot of stuff in the lectures that I already know that's um, kind yeah, of review sure. for me. But then there's some of it that is new material or it's material that I've forgotten since I took that class many years ago. Okay. And so it's a good refresher for me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I mean, it's oh, all good. interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It is. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, plus, I mean, you'll, you'll get the hang of how I teach too, and that'll make MinPet easier also. Mm -hmm. You'll get used to my test questions and <laughs> that kind of thing. But I'm mm -hmm. glad it's a good refresher for you and that it's not mm -hmm. too redundant. Hopefully the labs well, are all different. Mm -hmm. They are. Okay. Good. Well, right. you have, um, have a good weekend if I don't see you tomorrow. Probably Me won't. <laughs> I have my regulars on Fridays. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but I'll see you Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Bye, Mary. Okay, bye.